Thank you, Costa. So uh, I think I should go straight in my presentation. So I must apologize for the fact that I will not present anything from China, but from a neighboring country that is equally important, uh, which is Vietnam, which is also part, uh, let's say, of the Sinic uh, East Asian uh, world or system. So what I will uh, present to you is basically the the work that I did a few years ago uh, on the origin of an, a new public culture of, of uh, uh, contestation against the, the colonial regime. But beyond that, the, um, how do you say, the constitution of, of uh, what we call now a public sphere. Uh, 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 so a, a new form of public political engagement uh, through debate and 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 uh, discursive uh, interactions and exchange um, in in the context of Vietnam under colonial rule. So I will go with you very broadly with a lot of photos, and uh, I you know I assume that you are not all familiar with Vietnam. So uh, and then we can we can talk. So okay, you see Vietnam. This is really on the southern part of um, of uh, of the Chinese system, but on the northern part of Southeast Asia, what we call mainland Southeast Asia. And this is an old map, colonial map, that includes all what was then called Indochina, French Indochina, which included also uh, Laos and Cambodia. And Vietnam itself was divided into three countries with the southern one, the dark green one, Cochin China, uh being under the uh, uh i would say the the, the statute of, of a colony which meant that the french law in france were applied to that part of vietnam that's another map that shows the division between the this this uh, different components of what was once the federation of indochina uh all this was very recent by the way it, it, the 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 constitution of of the indochina dates from 19, uh, 1894. And before that, anyway, um, the French started to uh, occupy this part of the world, starting from Saigon, from the south, from Cochin, China, uh, from the 1860s. And that's the this part. Uh, and here, this map, you can see uh, it includes also Cambodia. And on the, on, on the west side, you see this big lake which is the, the second largest lake in, in, in the world, the Tongle Sap Lake. It's all part of what we call the Mekong uh, system uh, that leads to the Mekong Delta, which is at the very end, uh, south and south peak, peak of the um, point of, of, of this photo. This is the Mekong system and Delta. And in the middle, you have uh, a, a city uh, and a number of market cities, uh, of which the largest uh, was called Saigon. I mean, now it's Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and this region is extremely rich in um, in in uh, and fertile for rice cultivation. It's one of the richest uh, place for rice production. Actually, up to today, uh, they have like uh, three to four yields a year, and. Um, and Saigon, from a long period of time, uh, played an important part. And this is a map uh, dating from, uh, you know, the pre-colonial period by Vietnamese uh, of, I would say, mandarins following the the the, the, the Confucian system. Uh, uh, um, so yeah, I, I don't know to what extent you know, but Vietnam basically, as I say, was part of the Chinese system in the sense that in the um uh in the third century uh bc uh, uh it became part at some point of china and there was a lot of back and forth in what is today the north of vietnam uh the extreme south of vietnam including that region uh, southern vietnam and and saigon used to be part of another ensemble which is the the cambodian the khmer ensemble and they were part of, um, for quite a while, from the, um, uh, let's say, the 8th century to the 14th century, uh, 
uh, part of the Khmer and Korean Empire. Uh, so it's a totally different uh, cultural world. Uh, the Khmer civilization is much more connected to what was once called the Indianized Southeast Asia. Uh, yeah, so you, and, and, uh, and therefore Saigon, before the conquest by the Vietnamese in 1698, exactly, uh, used to be a Khmer city called Pre Nokor, the, 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 the Nagaram Nokor city in the forest. Uh, and and uh, so it's relative. It's a region that is relatively recently settled by the Vietnamese itself. And in fact, it was largely settled thanks to uh, many Chinese, um, the the Chinese supporters of the Ming Dynasty, who refused to serve when the Qing took over power in the uh, 16th, 17th century, uh, and they. Uh, instead of uh, staying and paying allegiance to the to the Manchus, preferred to leave, and they were big, powerful uh, maritime, uh, you know, uh, armies, and they paid allegiance to the then king of Cam of Vietnam, sorry, in the middle part of the country, and they were much more powerful than the king himself, so he he could not make them lose face because if he'd say anything, because obviously they were much more powerful than him. So he sent them to this part of, uh, of, of today's Vietnam, which at that time was Cambodian. So he sent the Chinese basically to establish, to Sinai's the place before the place became effectively part of Vietnam. So you see that's also complicated, but it again connects to, uh, to China and, 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 and your interest in China. Um, this is how this city evolved um, during the colonial time. And what is interesting, it's if you, it's a city, it's a, like many of those cities uh, um, in, in the region, it's a bicep, bipolar or bicephal city. Uh, on, on the right side, you have Saigon itself, which was the, the citadel, which was the political center uh, where the, 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 the Vietnamese administration uh, established and built uh, a citadel, and which later on became the the French, uh, uh, you know, center of of of, um, of power. And on the west, with all these red colored uh, buildings, and this was the Chinatown, the Chinese part of uh, of this urban ensemble which in fact, as I say, predates the period when the Vietnamese really established themselves there. Um, it's more complicated, but um, uh, the Chinese part is called in Vietnamese Tiolan, uh, which means big market. So it tells you, and this basically, uh, this place, Tiolan, is very much the connection between the whole uh, Mekong Delta uh, interland and the big river, Saigon River, that lead, that goes to to the sea for rice uh, trade, rice processing, etc. So, in fact, you have a city with two centers, which eventually now it's it's a big one urban uh, ensemble, but it shows the extent to which there is a, a distinct local Chinese and then Sino-Vietnamese uh, economic powerful elite that even predates the colonial. Uh, European period. Now I shift specifically to Saigon as the heart of colonial, uh, uh, the, the largest city of colonial Vietnam at the time. And uh, with all the attributes of a French colonial Republican in the Republican context, uh, uh, a city. Uh, I will mention that because it's important for what I was going to tell you about. So, um, but again, you, on one side, you have this uh, Saigon River. If you take a picture now, it's not much different. There are a few buildings, but this is just across the, the, the river from the, the town. And uh, they are always talking about developing that part, uh, but they haven't done it. It's the Pudong of, of uh, the, the failed Pudong of Vietnam, uh, if you want always to compare with uh, China. And this this is... This photo, an old photo, is of this, this system of canals that were built for a long time and 
uh, with these junks that used to be involved in this rice processing trade. Um, uh, this part, for instance, this is so I go fast, but it, I just wanted to give you an urban and then ensemble of the urban context. It's very important in, in the colonial context. This this is a picture of Tjolan, of Chinatown, uh, from the east towards the west. We you see these two water canal system, human uh, you know, built. And in on the in front you have this big market uh, built during the colonial time but with mostly private Chinese and Chinese Vietnamese or local Chinese uh, Chinese Vietnamese money, big capitalist money. So, uh, and it is still there today. So to show you the extent to which, and you see when you go towards the end, it's the end of the, the city and the beginning of the big plane, the Mekong plane. And these are the, uh, you know, pictures of how it used to be uh, in the twenties. That was how it, I knew it in the 90s, now it's all gone. All these uh, shop house, Chinese shop houses uh, date from the 1910s, 1920s, 30s, some were beautiful. And you used to see until uh, 10 years, 15 years ago, these factories along the, the canal for processing the rice. Um, all this is gone now. And then, of course, in Saigon, you have the French city, really, and uh, with all the attributes of a European and French, especially with the cathedral, Catholic, built on the location of an, previously of a pagoda. And that's this street, this fourth square is, is called, uh, it used to be called Katina Street. Now it's called Dong Khoi, which means Insurrection Street. And that's the main street of Saigon. And it also, it, it really epitomizes the, um, the urban culture as it developed as a blending between uh, Vietnamese, Chinese, and European urban uh, culture with things like cafe terrace, you know, okay, we are in Greece, everybody, yeah. But there are many parts of Europe, as you know, including Netherlands, where you don't have terrace culture. But the terrace culture was brought by the French and became totally um, localized. If you go to Vietnam or to Cambodia, you have terrace everywhere. An opera house, a hotel, the very important, what it used to be called the Continental Hotel, department store, and at the bottom, the seat, the the the, the, um, the 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 city hall, which is a small copy of the Paris City Hall. Um, so I wanted to show you this because it's part also of what I wanted to tell you about this urban public culture through. Uh, uh, and, and public political culture, especially through the press and newspapers. Uh, you need for the beginning of, of, of a public sphere to emerge in the modern sense of the ta uh, term, before, of course, internet, you need a number of environment, environmental settings, such as street, street uh, sidewalks, cafes, because cafes is where people will read, I will show you photos. Uh, you see this. Uh, okay, this photo is interesting because it's one newspaper, the headquarters of one big colonial newspaper. And um, okay, this photo dates from the fifties, uh, but it's it's it shows the this this culture, this culture of cafe in Vietnam in, in, in at the time until very recently, until 10, 15 years ago. Uh, people were sitting, have coffee, and read, and exchange newspapers and discuss. So this cafe became a public space also. Uh, um, so when I told you, uh, I want to talk to you about newspapers and political uh, contestation, I want to always frame it, anthropologically speaking, culturally speaking, as a way of life, as a sociability on its own. And, and many of these newspapers that I will tell you about used to be more than just a place to print paper and, and, and to write, but place where people could meet. They, would, they had a kind of a library and, and, and that's how you forge a sense of collectiveness in, in a modern time, time before internet. So photo again of Cafe Terras and uh, this is fo a photo from the fifties with the, you see the woman wearing this so-called traditional dress, which itself was invented or reinvented or created in the 
in the 30s that combines a trousers and a tunic. So everything is the result of this uh, hybridization of, of culture between the West and the East. Okay, so I give you this background, this urban setting, of, and imagine if you know French cinema, the tw you know the fifties, sixties. Okay, this is a bit. It was a bit like that. I don't want to romanticize it, but it was uh, very much. Now the Vietnamese. Um, now I need to tell you in that part in Cochin, China, as I explained on earlier, um, the the it, it, when France became a republic for the third time in 1870 after the the war with Germany, the end of the Second Empire and the Commune, the failed Commune in Paris. Um, one of the pillars of this new regime was freedom of press. And the media, the, the print media in France at the time, up to the 1930s, was consubstantial with the political uh, regime in France. Uh, and which means that at the time, on average, French people were the, the high, had the highest rate in, in newspaper reading in the world. Now it's Japan or, or Hong Kong. But in those days, it was, uh, it, it was Europe. So that had an impact, obviously, in the context of Vietnam and Saigon, because these, these press for, for, for media freedom uh, were there and were applied also in this part of the world. At some point, when the Vietnamese start to realize that uh, the French colonial system tried to uh, impose some, some uh, create some, some nuance, like uh, things that were printed in, not, not in French, including in Vietnamese, would be uh, subject to censorship because considered uh, using a law that was against German language. So you see how it's all these colonial legal uh, subtleties. So the Vietnamese had developed a name, which we in, in the West we call public sphere after the Habermas uh, theory for, for 18th century Europe. But in Vietnamese, they have a word which is totally local called Lang Bao Thi, which means the, the village, the newspaper village. This started with this early print uh, newspaper that was developed by the colonial regime when they started to, they wanted to build loyalty among the newly uh, conquered uh, natives. And it was basically news about what governments, uh, you know, um, you know uh, activities, etc. And it was usually published in Vietnam, Romanized Vietnamese. That's another thing I need to tell you. The Romanized Vietnamese was developed by uh, missionaries, by Portuguese, French missionaries back uh, in the 17th, 18th century. But it became widespread by the uh, under the colonial regime and in Chinese characters as well. So, uh, you know, this newspaper was bilingual. All this, this dates, uh, this newspaper dates from 1865 and, and basically, let's say 1880s, that's where things started to develop by, with the support of the French. By the 1900, you have already a new generation, new, it goes very fast. It's every 10 years, every five years, you have a new model of, of engagement that relates that 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 um, how do you say re relates to the generational change with people who are going through Western schools. In this case, this guy um, is a is member of the bourgeoisie, Vietnamese bourgeoisie, rich landowners, uh, fran fran uh, franchised. He has is a Catholic. He, so, you know, so because a lot of Catholics were there also even before the colonial time. So it's complicated. And he became a French citizen because he was a, and as a, as a French citizen, he was able to launch his newspaper. Only French citizens could launch, a, could own a newspaper. But of course, there were always ways for Vietnamese to use French rubber name, rubber stamp name, and then do whatever they wanted. So this one looked in Taiban, Taiban which means the six province uh, papers. Uh, and so this guy, without going into details, was the first one to 
use the press in Vietnamese and start to build a big, uh, fairly big, not, uh, you know, a few thousand, at, at least already, a uh, 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 readership that became almost a, a, the beginning of a political kind of a new um, community. Uh, so much so, and he supported underground nationalist movements, specifically in uh, in Japan. So there was a there is a whole movement in Vietnam called Dongzhu study in uh, going to the east to to Japan, and and he was promoting this. And the French finally found out, uh, and they exiled him. And okay, but to show you how things develop fast. Now, the First World War was a major catalyst uh, in Indochina, in Vietnam, like it, it was in all the colonial world. Uh, um, because um, for the first time, the European metropoles were at war with each other and they were weakened. Their, their fate was always at stake, France or the UK, France. That's when the colonial powers had to develop to, to establish a new form of contract with their own native populations in India, uh, like in, in Indochina for the French. And a number of Vietnamese were sent to to fight for, uh, on the front, uh, 30,000 of them. Um, that means that you really have the beginning of a new debate. Every, a lot of things change within Indochina politically. The control, the colonial power is no longer just top down. They need to create some new forms of, of um, how do you say, uh, to forge some sense of of, uh, of loyalty and, and support. Uh, uh, and, and that means participation of Vietnamese. That's at the same time as you have two pillar individuals in, in the pantheon of Vietnamese intellectual uh, and political uh, modern uh, thinking, this man, Phan Bo Chiao and Phan Thieu Chin. Phan Bo Chiao, these two are different and yet they are important in, in, I mean, you can compare with China for that. Phan Bo Chiao was a traditional uh, guy, elite. He, 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 he took the examination system, the imperial examin examination system like in China. And um, he thought that he decided to fight against the colonial, uh, you know, uh, imposition on, on his country. And he relied very much on the restoration of the monarchy. And he took refuge for a long time in Japan. And eventually, eventually he was arrested and he spent the rest of his life on internal exile, but free in central Vietnam. This man also was a former traditional Confucian educated scholar, intellectual, um, but at some point he, he was arrested by the French after an, an insurrection and he decided to convert to Republicanism. He was saved by a Freemason system and he believed that Vietnam needed to find a kind of middle way with the West and absorb a number of the Western uh, institutional uh, you know, uh, attributes to uh, in order to create a new country. And this man is also equally important in the context of the, the First World War. He's a French guy uh, who used to be a newspaper guy in France in owning with his brother, one of the most powerful newspaper at that time, and who was appointed governor general of Indochina at a time when the French were very, you know, if you remember 1916, 1917, the First World War, Nobody knows who's going to win. And if France collapses, okay, all this colony collapse. So uh, they had to play very smart to create some new kind of of, um, of consensus or, or support among the natives. So they sent a newspaper guy, not a military. And this guy is super smart because he tried to develop some very smart strategies to bring with him uh, uh, Vietnamese modernist thinkers who otherwise would have then been inclined to stand against the colonial system. Another guy on the right, Alexandre, the, the name doesn't fully uh, appear, Alexandre Varenne, was a socialist 
who later on became also um, governor general of Indochina. And these guys were Freemason, liberal minded. They were not for equality or for decolonization, I, I, of course, but they were for creating some new kind of compromise with uh, an arising uh, Vietnamese uh, political elite. And it, the, all this goes very fast. And I forgot to mention that Vietnam for France was important. It had 20 million people in 1900. So it's, uh, you know, it's relatively important uh, for an empire that had about 100 million uh, compared to India itself, which had 300 million, that's not so big. So the first generation, I go fast, of those intellectuals, activists, political activists, uh, you see them in, in just a few years going after, uh, you know, succeeding each other with each time a different message, a different approach, and, and ultimately um, a, a different forms of, of political uh, engagement. So you have what I would call the Mandarin journalists, again, Chinese, classically, ch classical Chinese educated individuals, like this guy, Ho Biu Chan, who was a very famous writer in southern Vietnam, and was part of this newspaper front, which was a newspaper that promoted economic modernization and agricultural modernization, something that, again, in Confucian context, is new, you know, uh, usually commerce, uh, and, and, and agriculture is not considered as the most important thing, but that's when it became, uh, that was their way to engage politically. They were not directly at the French, against the French, but they were into trying to promote a new form of self-strengthening as, as uh, it ex existed also in China uh, process. Very quickly, it's a matter of five, ten years, and each time of, of people with different itineraries, you have a new wave of intellectuals, political activists, those who went to study in, in uh, France, mostly, uh, like this guy, uh, Wei Guanxiu, very famous uh, intellectual from the bourgeoisie, tra uh, trained as an agriculture uh, uh, engineer, uh, uh, French becoming a French citizen, very uh, wealthy and so on, and that's him later on, who uh, was in favor of a compromise, but more than that, he wanted the Vietnam to basically transform themselves into French people, uh, total assimilation. So his newspaper was in French, La Tribune Indigène, that became La Tribune Indochinoise. And he always hoped that the, his strategy was hoping that the French regime will, mod, will accept eventually to in, include the Vietnamese as equal partners in this relationship. But of course, if you know colonial history, you don't have such a thing as an equal eventually uh, 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 term when, when it comes to, um, to politics. Uh, likewise with this man, Nguyen Phan Lao, interesting, he had his own newspaper, Le Co Anamit. Anam, Anam was the name for Vietnam. Uh, interesting, he's the first, the author of the first Vietnamese author of French, uh, uh, of novel in French. So to go it, it, to see how it goes fast. So already the introduction in newspapers of cartoons. This, this is interesting because this is a cartoon when these guys, one of their first political act, and they were all promoted by the Governor General Albert Sao, whom I told you about originally. Um, these guys launched an anti-Chinese boycott. Uh, uh, they followed the Chinese boycott against Japanese. Uh, goods after the 1919 treaty, uh, when the German, you know, possessions in China were handed were handed over to Japan, uh, but in Vietnam there's a rise, of, a national rise that first develops against the Chinese ethnic Chinese businesses within Vietnam, thinking that these guys are also. Their loyalty uh, is, is much more towards China than towards uh, Vietnam. So you had a whole, uh, you know, anti-Chinese uh, movement that that constitutes also as a as a movement na pre-nationalist movement before directly engaging with the French. And very quickly, you have a new generation. That's that's the 
the generation that got me interested in this subject, these young Vietnamese born after 1900. They were called the radicals and they were um, extremely impress impressive intellectually. They did all their study in France, in Paris mostly, and they were very much part of the avant-garde within France itself. Uh, some, like this man, was an anarchist, was also connected to the surrealist, surrealist movement in Paris. And um, he had al already integrated the thinking of modernization thinking, not only from China, which was for a long time, China and Japan were the main uh, point of reference for these Vietnamese intellectuals, as well as France, but also India, uh, North Africa, and many parts of the world, America, they became also important. So he's one of these guys through his newspaper, The Broken Bell, uh, using a term Broken Bell from Nietzsche. He was a Nietzschean guy. Uh, uh, that means when you have a broken bell, it sounds eerie and so disruptive. So he was a di disruptive thinking. In many ways, what he brought with him in terms of modernism, intellectual, uh, cultural, is still, in many ways, compare, compared to what Vietnam is today, still sometimes still subversive. For instance, he, he promoted the uh, free love, like no, uh, you know, and marriage after if only people love each other, this kind of thing that were really avant-garde at that time. But of course, he's also very clear about uh, colonization. He understands like many of these people of this generation, they start to be acquainted with new ideas, including Marxist and Leninist ideas uh, about imperialism. And, and they are the ones who take the French to the, to the test of their own principles. And after a few years, he understands that, okay, they are not going to, uh, to, um, to uh, how do you say, to um, upheld their, their, their principles of Republican principles. Another very short thing, but interesting, one of the guys, one of the people, part of that in, intellectual uh, fermentation fever was a couple, uh, you know, many people know André Malraux, he was, uh, he was, he never got the Nobel Prize, but he's one of these great uh, intellectuals uh, close to the Communist Party who fought Many, uh, you know, he fought at the, in the Spanish Civil War. He was uh, 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 resistant in France. He became the big minister of culture of post uh, Second World War in France, big writer and an opener of, of thinking with towards Asia. Uh, yeah, let's see, for China, of course. Uh, okay. And his wife, uh, Jewish, uh, French woman, avant garde feminist, who came with him. And they, were involved together with another guy, a French uh, activist, uh, completely forgotten now uh, from there. And these people joined the radical avant-garde Vietnamese to promote total equality and, and the end of colonization. So you have for a few years this wonderful mix, you know, and, and they were very uh, uh, fighting against a very despotic and, and, and corrupt local uh, uh, colonial regime. Of course, these people are Western educated, they're very avant-garde, they really, uh, so they have sometimes difficulties to bridge their own knowledge and experience with the non-Westernized uh, la large population. Um, yeah, that's another newspaper. That's a caricature of the then minister, uh, governor of Cochin, China, who, by the way, was from the French West Indies and who was black. So, you know, Fran French Republican system included sometimes colonials from other colonies, e even brown colored people to be governor in, in. So that's the ambiguity of the way France developed its own colonial system, uh, you know. Um, and then you have among these radicals, these new people, mostly coming from North Vietnam, who are less acquainted with French culture. They are they don't they didn't go all the way to French universities. They are more at uh, at ease in, in Vietnamese, and 
they are more radicalized and evolve. It's a staunchest, strongest nationalism. And this guy joined a newspaper which became at some point the largest newspaper in in uh, in Vietnam and especially in Saigon, the Dong Phap Toi Bao, which means the, um, uh, the 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 Times of of Indochina, uh, of French Indochina, um, and he managed to break away break the French censorship on in Vietnamese. Um, and another guy I want to put here, French educated lawyer, Pavan Cheng, a guy who lived in France for many years. He launched another newspaper, Lanam, important because he's the one who brought into Vietnamese and Vietnam the Communist Manifesto and, and Marxism. All this, 1924, 25, 26, you know, it goes very fast. Uh, that that's a, uh, another caricature of the way people are treated by the colonial system, and of that generation, another figure. I, it, these are emblematic figures. That's why I want to show you Zebanki. Import uh, this guy was important because he took over this newspaper, the same newspaper. He was also French educated. He had a lot of money, and he really turned news this these political newspapers into what we would call now. Um, uh, information media. So his policy was Vietnamese don't just need political pamphlets, they need to learn about the world. He brought, he brought in photographies in newspapers, etc. Uh, uh, and, 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 and with the idea that ultimately Vietnam will be independent and Vietnamese need to learn about the world. All this in a question of a few years. Meanwhile, and I want to put it in a larger context, you have another group of activists, not in Saigon, in exile, in France, then in Soviet Union, then in China, who are, um, who are more radicalized, also embraced uh, Marxism, usually in Paris, uh, this Nguyen Ai Quoc, which is the future Ho Chi Minh, whom you heard about, was together in Paris with this man, Pamanche. And Ho Chi Minh is important because he was an activist. He joined. This photo is important because this is the when the French Communist Party was established in, in 1920 and uh, 22, and is one of the founders of the uh, French Communist Party. Uh, these people in Paris at at some point um, um, launched a newspaper together with other colonized people of French colonies and beyond. Uh, there is a book, by the way, very interesting, if you have a chance, by an American, uh, no, a German uh, historian that takes Paris between the two wars as the center of the future third world thinking, third worldism. And, and, and that's, it's true that you, that's where you had Indian intellectuals, you had um, Latin American, you had Asian, uh, uh, and they all African and they converged in Paris and they met each other. Then Xiaoping, for instance, Chu and Lai. So then Xiaoping lived one street off from Ho Chi Minh, for instance, plus other other uh, uh, you know um, activists who later on became leaders of their countries. So this newspaper, the Paraya, was not just a Vietnamese newspaper, and you know that it's called organ of the oppressed people, of the people oppressed in the colonies, including people from Bengal, from British colonies or, or, um, or Dutch colonies and so on, uh, participated in this paper. Together with this man, Nguyen interesting, that's another newspaper, also printed in Paris, uh, which means the, they were radical uh, Marxist uh, uh, activists. An independentist. Now, okay, without go back to Saigon very quickly. The man Fan Chutin, one of the two man I men I show you at the beginning, intellectual, the second one, when he, he died in Saigon, and his funerals led to the first big physical demo public demonstration where the cityscape was for the first time occupied by the Vietnamese and not by the French. The, the colonial city space. So you have these these pictures, very important, and that's the people think this is the trigger of the end of 
the the illusion of a compromise with the French and the beginning of not of of a discourse that has already incorporated the idea that um, there is no way to to uh, how do you say to compromise and to uh, to collaborate. Eventually, the colonialism will have to be fought uh, even physically, and that goes together with new development. And again, I I, I make this to for you because you are China focused. Uh, one of the things we said about Chinese uh, communism is it's Maoism, especially it's its predilection for countryside rather than urban. What I told you was very much about urban, the uh, politicization and okay. M whilst Saigon became this commune of political activism that continued to grow up to the 30s, radicalize itself, but could not prevail against colonial the power of colonial uh, you know uh, the colonial system you had something that started in the countryside first it starts through religious millenarianist movements and in southern vietnam you have this fascinating um uh syncretic religion that brings together confucius jesus aristotle uh, and uh, also uh, Victor Hugo, you know, that's it. They had their own uh, Vatican, their own churches. You still have them. This is a recent photo. And uh, this group became very, for a while, extremely scary for the colonial regime because in, in the space of few months, big truck trucks of, of Southern Vietnam converted to this religion, this millenarist religion. And this movement at some point stopped, but what came afterwards is the beginning of a communist uh, form of, I would say, uh, millenarianism, or I don't know, uh, a new uh, ideology also within the countryside. And this is a tract, this is from a pamphlet uh, from in, in, the, in the country. And with the organization in the late, late 1920s, early 30s of Soviets, uh, I, I don't have time to, to tell you, but that's where Communist Party of Vietnam was established. It was established in 28, but it was, uh, it became visible for the colonial uh, power in 1930. And there were big repression. For the first time, the use of planes to bomb uh, the countryside, especially in the center of Vietnam. And these are tracts, newspapers uh, in this called Tanian, youth, the youth newspapers. Meanwhile, uh, in the city, you, as I said, in the 30s and late 30s, you really have a radicalization with a new breed of intellectuals, totally westernized and tot moving beyond uh, uh, nationalism. They are what, what we call the Trotskyists, in fact, they were totally internationalists. They were Trotskyists just because they were in opposition with the Stalinists who became more and more prevalent in, in, in the resistance by the mid, middle of the 30s. Uh, and these people are important because as internationalists, they sent people to fight the civil war in Spain, for instance. And in 1939, they won the municipality of Saigon. So for a few months in a colonial city, you had you had anarchists, internationalists who were who run the city of Saigon. To tell you how interesting it is, and the newspaper at that time was called La Lutte, the struggle, and that's an interesting photo because it's a picture from colonial police that shows somebody hand of handing over a, an a, an issue of La Lutte between people, you know, and along these things you have also the Starting from the 20s, what I told you, you have an, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of other side developments, including the rise originally of, for instance, uh, the promotion of women, which was very much developed by um, Confucius, Confucian trained intellectual scholars who thought that in order to be modern, women need to have better education. But they were all men. At some point, this discourse were taken on by women themselves. 
And by the mid 30s or early 30s, you have women activists like this woman, uh, uh, Bao Lentai, who, who became that, that the, the, the subject of a very great book on, on, um, uh, on, on Vietnamese modernism uh, uh, in the 30s. Uh, a, a young woman who was involved in a, in a whole uh, accident, as you say, incident, um, a love relationship with an activist and another one being jealous who killed the other one. I mean, the whole story, a whole drama, uh, very Vietnamese, but which led the French police who investigated this, this suicide or murder, sorry, to discover the antenna of the Communist Party of Vietnam. And this woman was spent 10, 15 years in jail as a result. So to show you by the 30s, you have this development. Meanwhile, you have this bourgeoisie. She's the daughter of one of the bourgeois established French educated man I told you about, Henriette Bouy. She's the first trained doctor, medical doctor, French, first woman, Vietnamese woman with a driving license and, and with an airplane license. Uh, so to show you, and eventually she became a, a master of acupuncture. Uh, you know, so you have this cosmopolitan uh, culture also. This newspaper, Funut and Van, means women's news. And that became, by the mid-30s, the main anti-colonial uh, magazine. And it was less about the political system, changing politics, but rather changing society. So there's a, you know, 30s in China, in India, it's a period of introspection and modernization rather than just pure confrontation. People already are, are mature enough politically to know that the political system is not uh, changeable. So I'm finishing to wrap up. As you know, what happened, 1940, the Second World War, Japan uh, is moving into Southeast Asia uh, and including in, uh, in Indochina. Uh, the Vichy regime in Paris, in France, was an ally of Japan which was an ally to Germany and, and, and Italy. So for a while, the Japanese were in, in the China alongside with the French. It was a kind of a, an, an easy coexistence, cohabitation, until France was finally liberated in 44, and, or, or late, uh, early 45, actually, when then the, the Japanese staged a coup to put all the French uh, people into jail and to run Vietnam until the bombs, the, the atomic bombs in, in Japan and the surrender and a power vacuum in Indochina, like most Southeast Asia, like if you know Indo Indonesia, for instance, Dutch Indonesia. And that's when Vietnamese activists led by Ho Chi Minh and his colleagues, co uh, Stalinists, proclaim independence on the 2nd of September, 1945 in Hanoi and in Saigon. And that's the beginning of a new era with the Communist Party uh, running in the China, uh, uh, Vietnam, and which led to colonial uh, and then a uh, war of, you know, and, and eventually also uh, the first stage of a Cold War war in Indochina and Vietnam in particular, leading to Yemen Phu, the, the defeat of the French in 1954, which is con considered in the global south often as what we call the Bastille Day of the South. Division of Vietnam until 75. Southern Vietnam became really where continued to be this hotbed of me messy but creative uh, political contestation and expression until so the, all these newspapers, some of the guys I told you about continued in, until this, in this period, until the collapse, the fall of Saigon in April um, 75. And when US withdrew, you remember all this. That's the end of what, of what I would call this, um, this newspaper village, this, this public culture print contestation in Vietnam, which resurrected, we re, which resurrected again recently uh, 10, 15 years ago through internet. And that's where we are now, where the uh, 
political contestation in Vietnam now is extremely uh, controlled, like in China. The the there's a it's it's there's not a great war uh, internet war like in China, but the Vietnamese syst- uh, regime has very intrusive system to control, and regularly people are arrested, uh, dissidents through internet, like these two guys just a few uh, two months ago or one month ago. Uh, you, you just click on the internet, every month there are people being arrested. So there's a cat and mouse game continuing uh, in Vietnam, and uh, that's that's it. So that's my book. Uh, that's uh, what I wanted to do. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Philip. So we have with us uh, Professor Dantzis Knowles, who is a Fulbright scholar visiting Greece, and so she would like to see discussion, but I will abuse my role as chair to, to throw in the first question. Go ahead. Um, and that question is um, uh, the role of censorship. So how was censor- censorship organized? Uh, was it effective? It doesn't sound it was that effective, actually. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether the fact that the French and the Portuguese missionaries created this new language wasn't this a tool for nationalism in the end of the day? And was the French censorship in position? You know, were they French censors that were could actually read the new language or not? Yeah, okay, that's a very deep question because when you deal with language, uh, modernization of language, it's it's uh, it's a fascinating subject. In fact, um, uh, okay, first of all, censorship. Uh, was to some extent effective. I want to show you some guys from earlier on who, who were involved in that. And and uh, uh, yeah, this man is an important figure because uh, okay, until the French invasion of southern Vietnam and slowly the progression to uh, Tonkin, North Vietnam, Hanoi. Um, and in 1884, so it's 18 French start in 1864, 65 in the south. Uh, I mean, they start in 59, but 64 is when they take over the south of Vietnam. 84, that's where they take the north. Um, the, the 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 kingdom or the empire, uh, the emperor Huang De, like in, in you say like in Chinese, Huang De, Huang De in, in, in Vietnamese, was established in Hue in central Vietnam. We had a system of examination. People were, the whole system was based on uh, in Mandarin or uh, you know, examination and civil service, like in China. Uh, this system continued until 1916 when the examination were abolished. By then already this Romanized system, which existed as I said for a long time for the the, the 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 Jesuits to to try to proselytize became the really the mainstream in Saigon. So to show you how the southern city of Saigon, even before other parts of Vietnam were fully under French uh, control, uh, this city became uh, be- began to propagate this new form of writing very quickly. Which meant that at some point the, the imperial uh, system decided to abolish and uh, the, the the system and to create a new education. They had a a new school called Kwakha, which means national education. Uh, um, in 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 Hawaii, and, and and that means that you have people who start to who were educated in characters, but who also start to study and write in Romanized system. And like this man, And but they brought with them a lot of uh, colloquialism, a lot of Chinese traditional literary system into uh, Vietnamese uh, vernacular writing, meaning that it was very difficult for people to understand. Even among Vietnamese, if you are a few years we have a few years difference of age because the educational system changes so fast. That means that when it comes to censorship, it was not easy for the colonials themselves. So this guy, for instance, who wrote like 
30, 40 novels in Romanized Kokno, it means uh, it means national writing, uh, uh, literally, um, was able to confuse the censors who were Vietnamese. And they were in the archives, I found there's a lot of complaint about this guy. This guy was very interesting because he was uh, an, uh, an advisor to the governor of southern Vietnam, of Cochin, China. At the same time, he was publishing these novels and these newspapers who promoted anti-colonial thinking, always through very complex metaphors, not directly through stories, but people slowly understood. So already at that time, it was very difficult for censorship to uh, to um, prevail. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, you have later on, this man managed to, uh, and he's from another generation, he's from Hanoi. The By then the Romanized system becomes very much, um, how do you say, um, uh, stabilized as a modern, language. Many words, as you know, probably if you know China, so many words etymologically were coined by Japanese intellectuals by looking at ancient Greek. So the connection with Greece, I just have to say. So the Vietnamese don't know how much they are themselves connected to Greece, but they are because of the Japanese and then Chinese. So many of these terms are new concepts, modernized concept from the West with new etymologies. So this generation have already incorporated these new terms. So they are easier to read. And yet what their, their attitude, their technique will not be the same as the previous generation. They will be just by bypassing or forgetting or uh, and continuing to publish, even if Many newspapers, many piece of issues or, or front pages will be blanked by the censors to the point that at some point the censors give up. So that's this guy succeeded in 25, 26. He overwhelmed the system in a way that, okay, the, the end, uh, everything was possible and published. So then the Korean regime created another tactic to try to intimidate the the owners of newspapers to destroy economically, to try to undermine them. Because legally, freedom of expression was a law in Southern Vietnam. That's why the French were caught in their own contradiction. You did mention Japan quite a bit. And I live in Japan. I live in Tokyo. I've lived there the last decade. And what I found out when I moved to East Asia and Japan was that the Japanese have such a love for newspapers. I mean, they even had a department of the study of newspaper history at Keio University. Very unusual if you compare it to the American Academy, where you would major in communications or journalism. There isn't quite that love affair with the newspaper. Highly illiterate, highly literate society, very well educated people. Um, I'm more sort of modern. Uh, I have kind of a modern hat on in looking at Vietnam. And when I was there a year ago in Hanoi only, um, I visited with a Vietnamese woman, the Ho Chi Minh, the mausoleum. We stood in line and she had never gone because the lines are so long. She just never thought she could get to the, the entry, but it was really quite moving. While I was there, since I was coming from Japan, I was really curious about any affection the young people had for the Japanese, J-pop and Japanese pop culture. And to my surprise, the language that the young people in Vietnam want to learn and the culture they want to study is Korean. So this, when I returned to Japan and told them, they, they had such, you know, they were a little bit disappointed because the Japanese were obviously there early on, as you pointed out, as an imperial war regime. We know they got defeated. But then with the U.S. coming in and occupying, um, Japan became this economic juggernaut. So 
the problem for Japan, though, is it sort of lacked, uh, it was in economy only, but it kind of lacked the personal touch. And I, I think the Koreans have an advantage there with the film and the emphasis they've put on public diplomacy. I was going to add, I emphasize in my work a lot of public diplomacy. I had a question about one of the newspapers where it looked like the subtitle had propaganda, democratic propaganda. And uh, and then I was glad that the women showed up. <laughs> I was worried that they were completely invisible, but in a lot of the photos, they weren't there. And yet you showed the woman, the kind of bourgeois woman, and I was struck at how long she lived. 106 or something. Yes. Wow, that was that was really stunning. Another just last thing, I, I um, the exaltation of the peasant. So when I went to Vietnam, isn't there symbol the water buffalo? So that when you think about somebody laboring in the rice fields, uh, they they really even just somebody you meet casually will talk about that kind of work ethic and the people from the grassroots, we might say, but these are from the rice fields. So it makes sense that the philosophy and the sort of the propagation of uh, equality and decolonization would make sense. And if you take it back then, bring it up to Xi Jinping in China, I was in Zhejiang province, Jinyun County last summer in August, Xi Jinping was the party secretary and governor. And that is all rural. There's no really big city. I mean, you have to fly into Shanghai. And it is like going back in time. I had never experienced a China like that. I'd only gone to Beijing. And so when I was there, I realized, okay, I'm making these connections, which you have helped me to make even more today, the power of the word, and that sort of collective understanding of what's going on with people sharing the newspaper. I'm so glad you pointed that out, the anthrop anthropological aspect to it. So just a lot of observations going on. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can say first about uh, newspaper readership. Uh, as you say, in fact, yeah, Japan is today the country with the highest uh, readership uh, uh, level per capita. Hong Kong used to be until recently. Uh, Shanghai pre-49 and Saigon pre-75. So it's, uh, and uh, you could add also uh, Calcutta uh, in, in India. So so the, the, the press, the print media, at some point became very important in many countries. And I'm talking about Asia, but also beyond, of course. So uh, that phenomenon is very, you can compare. It's just what is interesting is that in Japan, well, it's still a democratic country. As a result, uh, the press, you have a lot of, uh, uh, in Vietnam now, people, uh, yeah. You know, personally, you know, I lived there for five years. At some point I got almost physically sh sick of when I saw a Vietnamese paper because of the propaganda. It's so, it's so annoying. It's so it's, obvious. Yeah, it's so uh, it's always nonsense. I mean, all that from, from yeah, okay. So no, so that's of course it's it got killed. It continued until 1975. That's it was chaotic. There was censorship also. There was a lot of uh, bad things there. But at least this culture of of diversity, I would say, uh, was still there. Now, uh, the point you make, uh, you made about um, uh, women. Yeah. So, yeah, this is very important. I just wanted to, it's difficult to put, my point was, uh, at some point I wanted to show how a phenomenon that was almost artificially brought up by Confucian trained intellectuals, like in Japan, like in China, uh, I mean, in Vietnam is famous, but it's also in China. I read the same. Uh, the first feminists were all men, and they are not. They don't care about women, but they say, "Okay, this is one of the factors." They 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 study the West and like why the West is doing so well and we are doing so badly. I mean, so 
One thing is, okay, women are educated, and which is not always true, because culturally, I mean, in case of Vietnam, the, uh, women were educated, but they had this idea that in the West, they were more educated, etc. So, so at some point, they had all these programs to, to organize, to develop schools, private schools for girls, because it was not the priority of the colonial regime. And that's true also in Indonesia, Dutch Indonesia, in British India, in American Philippines. So it's basically in many ways, the West were not advanced compared to Asia when it comes to women education, um, even in a Confucian context. But uh, okay, at some point, you have women who picked up, pick up the ball basically. And you have already, it's, it's interesting in, in my book, there's, there's some section on that. Well, some women start to say, hey, uh, yeah, well, it's not just about national liberation, it's also us. So, you know, you have subgroup development. There are others that are interesting, uh, but are more specific to Vietnam, like between North, South, Central. You have different in internal groups, subgroup of societies that emancipate themselves within the context of anti colonial. Uh, intellectual and political, uh, uh, you know, emancipation mo movement. So, so yeah, and then what I want to sh show is that in the 1930s, in many ways, as I, I tried to explain, uh, by the late 20s, by the early 30s, most educated, smart uh, 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 Vietnamese know that uh, somehow they, um, they, they have no illusion with the colonial system. They know it was, that's why communism became so prevalent or national, ultra-nationalism, the most pre-fascism somehow. And uh, the Kuomintang, you have the Vietnam Quoc Zandang, which was the equivalent, except that it got completely suppressed by the colonials and they never re-emerged from it. And the Stalinist Communist Party was able to take over, uh, take precedence. So uh, so that's where there was an, an effort, conscious or not, to go deeper into one's own society, uh, culture, society. You know, in India, that's where the, the, the Dalits became an issue, the, 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 the intouchables, the caste system. That's in the 30s. Uh, Ambedkar, all these intellectuals. In Vietnam, that's where you have these stories about uh, rural development about uh, women, etc., and that's why the newspaper, the magazine was not a newspaper. Punet and Lander, I showed you, became the new um, place or location of contestation, for, for anti-colonialism, but not directly against uh, the. You know, it's all about we are. We need to modernize ourselves. And and these are quite modern. You see this a bit Art Deco style. You have a lot of new things coming up through this month. Uh, I, yeah. I made a mistake in um, when I arrived to Hanoi and we were driving around. I said, "Oh, this reminds me of Beijing," <laughs> and it was. It's really clear that the Vietnamese are so proud of their own system they they don't really they didn't like the comparison to china i mean it For wasn't sure. that offensive okay the relation between <laughs> vietnam and china yeah. is yeah. very complex right, and, uh, right. Know, they, they don't like it. yeah that's yeah. clear yeah uh of course culturally they they said the main framework of reference was china and, but they don't want to be chinese oh, yeah. and then of course it's all political state politics I and mean, nothing is very uh, you know, so free in the way uh, it, it, things are expressed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and then, yeah, but if you think of the cosmology, the thinking Hanoi is like Beijing, it's the northern uh, city, uh, Beijing in the north, uh, Hanoi is in the, yeah. So, and the south is more like, uh, you know, from Cantonese uh, culture. There's a lot of commonalities in the way of thinking as well. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm very conscious of the fact that people need to catch a bus yeah, because sorry, of the strike. Yeah. So we will uh, stop here. But of course, uh, if anyone has a question, I'm sure uh, Dr. Pekam is, uh, is happy to continue the discussion. Uh,
outside the decent, perhaps yeah, 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 over yeah, over a uh, glass of wine. Sure. Okay, so thank you all uh, for coming on such a difficult day. I'm grateful to Dr. Pekam uh, for uh, for his uh, yeah, expertise, yeah. for his expertise, for his uh, presence here in Athens, and for his friendship. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, sure, yes. We have to wrap up. Uh, did you want to give some newsletters? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will. I will take the newsletters. If somebody, okay, 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 good. Thank you. Very good. That's why you know. Contemporary. Yeah, I just.